Good afternoon and welcome to all of you listening to this webinar on the sustainable use of green hydrogen for mobility and transportation systems. This is a webinar that is presented to you by SG Innovate, by the Japan Tech Science and Technology Agency, and by EFD, the German Research Foundation. My name is Thorsten Klausing. Uh, I work at the German Embassy here in Singapore, and I'm really looking forward to the, today's discussion on hydrogen technology. As you are certainly aware, hydrogen technology has been increasingly in the limelight in recent years, mainly due to its potential to contribute to the decarbonization of our energy supply. We know that uh, due to the dangers of man-made climate change, we urgently need to get away from fossil fuels to decarbonize our energy supply. And therefore, hydrogen technology is a very timely topic. We know, of course, that this is also particularly relevant in the context of transportation, because transportation, still using a lot of fossil fuels, is one of the main sources of uh, um, greenhouse emissions. And therefore, we are very happy to have some leading experts today to tell us how we can overcome the present problems with the existing technology and replace it by hydrogen technology. Obviously, one should also note that as um, climate change is a global challenge, this is not something that one country could overcome on its own. This is something where we need international collaboration, which was also the motivation for us to come up with this webinar as a trilateral exercise involving experts from Singapore, Japan and Germany. And I'm quite confident that today we will not only get an overview of all the latest developments in these three countries in hydrogen technology, which probably to a large degree will already be the results of international cooperation, but that also we will get an understanding of what would be the future avenues to foster even more cooperation between these three countries and beyond on sustainable technology. As I said, we have been able to get three very eminent researchers today to present to us on this topic. So first of all, we have from, from Singapore, Dr. Chen Lu Wei, who is the team leader on decarbonization strategy at the newly created Institute of Sustainability for Chemicals, Energy and the Environment here in Singapore at the Agency for Science, Technology and Research. Furthermore, we have Professor Yichiro Himeda, who is a senior expert at the Global Zero Emissions Research Center at Japan's National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology. And thirdly, we have Professor Carsten Müller, who is the chair of the Institute for Technical Thermodynamics at the University of Rostock. Today's discussion will be moderated by my colleague Emi Kaneko from the Japan Science and Technology Agency. So at this point, I will hand over the floor to you, Emmy, to continue. Thank you very much, Justin, and uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm Emmy Kaneko from Japan Science and Technology Agency, Singapore office. So the organizers of today's webinar are very much pleased to have three prominent speakers from Germany, Japan, and Singapore. Uh, my colleague Trostan did uh, all the introduction of the speakers, so uh, let me uh, simply invite our first speaker from Germany, Professor Karsten Müller. Professor, please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, and I hope that everyone can see my screen now. Yes, we are able to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so. Um, Hello and welcome uh, from Germany. Um, I want to briefly present a little bit what we are doing here in Rostock, research on hydrogen storage technologies and the specific focus which we have here 
um, which is green transport, particularly in large scale, um, and with a special focus on marine applications. So apl application of hydrogen in ships, because uh, we know, all know that batteries are a great technology and they will be important. And there are many situations where batteries make much more sense than hydrogen does. But there are also applications where hydrogen is the only reasonable application. Hydrogen or products derived from hydrogen. And one of these applications is definitely the um, utilization in the marine industry. So ships will never run on batteries. The work we're doing here in Rostock is mainly done in collaboration. There are two institutes involved in this work. There's first the Institute of Technical Thermodynamics, um, which I'm heading, but there's also the chair of Professor Bert Buchholz, who's uh, head of the Institute of Piston Engines and Combustion Machines, which does not really sound like hydrogen technology. But if you keep in mind that hydrogen can not only be converted in fuel cells, for example, um, in many cases, it makes much more sense to use hydrogen or product derived from hydrogen in combustion engines. But these combustion engines, of course, need to be adjusted to the new applications and to the new fuels. So if we're talking about marine applications, ships and other applications on, on the sea. There are several criteria that are very important. One important thing, so of course, gravimetric density, but when we're talking about hydrogen and specifically on the sea, the most important thing is volumetric density. This gravimetric is quite good. So the amount, amount of energy per mass, that's usually not the problem. The problem is the amount of energy per volume. That's really the challenge particularly on ships. Another thing is storability. Um, for example, if we look at liquefied hydrogen, that's a great thing in some applications, but the problem is that you have these boil off losses. Um, so the storage is not that easy. And if we look at compressed hydrogen, it's also a nice technology, but the problem is that it's not so easy to handle and, and to store it and to keep, this should be, kept in mind as an important criteria. What's also very important, of course, is safety. If we're talking about ships, we are far away from the coast, far away from help. Um, so any failure can really become problematic. So, and resilience, so the ability of the system to recover from disturbance becomes um, highly pronounced and becomes an important task for us because repair is so complicated. Mechanical aspects become very important. Um, if we look at land-based applications, hydrogen can be handled quite easily um, because there's not much shaking going on. But when, on, when you're on a ship, the system is shaking all over again the whole time. And these mechanical aspects have to be taken into consideration. An important thing, of course, are conversion losses. If you store hydrogen, if you produce hydrogen for electricity, you recover energy from the hydrogen, you have losses and you have storage losses. For example, if you look at liquefied hydrogen, you're losing hydrogen energy over time. So there are these aspects of the storage itself. The reliability is very important. And then there's the efficiency. So what we are looking at when we're dealing with hydrogen is a whole bunch of different aspects. For me, it's a thermodynamicist. Of course, efficiency is always an important thing I always want to look at, but it's also important to look at the other things, the economics, the system size, which is very crucial on ships, environmental aspects, safety, reliability. All these have sub fields, subtopics, um, and there are many interconnections between the different topics. So if we're talking about hydrogen, there's one thing that comes into the mind of most people. Um, to my experience, this is very pronounced in Germany, but also um, outside Germany. There's one picture that 
a black and white picture, which is um, 85 years old, which still up to now may, may, mainly determines the impression people have regarding hydrogen. And that's this picture. That's the picture of the airship Hindenburg from the year 1973, uh, 37, sorry. Um, in Lake Hurst, this airship filled with hydrogen caught fire, it was a huge flame, um, and half of the people on board this airship died. Here's another picture of a burning airship. Why am I showing you this? I'm not showing you this because I'm such a big fan of burning airships. The interesting thing about it is this airship was filled with helium. So the problem with the Hindenburg was not the hydrogen. If we go back to the picture, you can tell from the from the picture what's the color of the flame. That sounds like a stupid argument for a black and white picture, but if you know that hydrogen flames are basically bluish to colorless, you can definitely tell that this is not a hydrogen flame. This is definitely a flame which is yellow orange. And what's burning here is the coating on the balloon. But there was a coating on the balloon to prevent hydrogen from le leaving the balloon. And this coating was burning. And that was the problem. That was also the problem here with this other airship. So the impression many people have regarding hydrogen that it's a very dangerous explosive component is largely exaggerated, but still one should be aware that this conception is with many people um, and still it's worth to have a closer look at these safety and reliability issues. And that's one of the things we're doing here. Um, and to introduce this, I want to briefly go to an example from batteries. So that's a press report um, from the year 2013. So it's about eight years old. Uh, and what happened back then was that the Tesla, one single car of this back then very new company caught fire. No one get injured. There was just the car burning. Um, and the next day on the stock market, the Tesla stock, it didn't totally crash, but it went down heavily. So nobody got injured in the incident but the shares dropped by 10% within two days. Well, we all know that Tesla obviously survived this incident, um, but still it shows us that single failure incidents, even if, they, if no one gets really hurt, but let's say at least they are impressive, can have a tremendous effect on the chances for success for a new technology. So, Back then, eight years ago, this could have to hold, held back the um, battery electric vehicle technology severely. So it's really worth to have a closer look at this reliability. This reliability has influence on a lot of aspects. So, for example, one important aspect when it comes to reliability, of course, is the safety thing. So, Health risks should be avoided if people get injured, in worst case, people die. Um, that's really a big problem, should be avoided. Um, the environment is highly related to it. So it's, it's nice if we have green hydrogen technologies, whatever, have our great LOHCs, whatever. But we're, if we have failures over and over and we are releasing hazardous substances like toluene, methyl cyclohexane, dibenzotoluene, whatever, into the environment, then we don't really have a benefit regarding the environment. So reliability is also highly linked to environment. Reliability is also linked to system size. Sounds like something where there should be no connection. So why should a more reliable system be larger or smaller than a small than a less reliable system? But what we should keep in mind is the fact that um, reliability is re usually um, caused by redundancy. So to make a more reliable system, we have all our elements not only once, but we have redundant parts there, which increases our reliability. 
decreases failure risk. It makes the system larger. And if we look at transport applications, if we look at ships, but also cars and other examples, reliability has an effect and an interlink with the system size. Reliability is, as I tried to intro already introduce this, crucial for the acceptance. So the public acceptance is highly influenced by risk awareness. So if people have the feeling that they might get injured, that's a problem. And also trust in the technology suffers if the, the people get the feeling that, um, okay, I'm not really in danger, so, so I'm not getting injured here, it doesn't kill me, but still um, I'm afraid that the system is not working half of the time. So people want systems that are operational with more than 99% reliability over time. And that's really important for the actual acceptance and therefore the success of the technology. And reliability is highly important regarding economics. Um, of course, that's linked to the acceptance. If people don't accept it, they won't buy it. Okay. Um, but economics also influenced with reliability. For example, if you say we wanted to make the technology highly efficient, then you can do this, but you have to invest a lot. So the investment costs get high if you are very a very high input. Um, you can have a cheaper if you say, okay, I accept higher um, risks, uh, maybe accept a little more, more frequent failures, but we should also keep in mind its revenue. So a system which is failing quite often and has downtimes doesn't produce. So you can't make money on a system that's not running. And that's also an aspect that has to be kept in mind with reliability. Now the question if we're talking about reliability is if we're talking about new technologies. And with most hydrogen technologies, we are talking about rather new technologies that are not used with tens of thousands of units in the field for several years or better decades. So where do we know how, the reli how reliable the technology is and where are the weaknesses that should be addressed? And there are quantitative measures that can help us with this task. The starting point for all these analysis is the flow sheet of the process. Okay, we say, okay, the process is supposed to look like this. We have all these elements. We make a list of the components. Think about what could be the potential failure modes, assign failure rates to all these failure modes. Um, and in the end, use this to calculate failure rates, not only for the individual components, but for the overall system. And we can use this, we can do this. And I just brought you a very short, very simple example here from a research project we had recently where we tried to evaluate alternative fuels, which many of them are derived from hydrogen, for example, like ammonia can be produced from hydrogen, LOHCs, liquid organic hydrogen carrier is a hydrogen technology. Methanol can also be derived from hydrogen. And yeah, LNG, well, you, theoretically, you could produce, produce it from hydrogen. Nowadays, it's, it's fossil, but so, so we have many hydrogen-based technologies in here. And we're comparing these um, regarding their failure rate. So how often do we expect a failure to occur on ships? And we see, of course, there are some error margins that should be kept in mind. Um, but we see that there are clear differences. And we see, for example, that LOHC and ammonia have rather low failure rates if you compare them to many LNG technologies. So LNG-driven ships are quite prone to failure. And that's something we should keep in mind. Um, and so if we make a decision on how to run our ships, so our future ships, also airplanes, cars, whatever. Um, it's of course important to see how economic they are, how efficient the different technologies and so on. But one aspect that should definitely be taken into account is the reliability of the process, its resilience and so on. Things which I, I'm not going to present due to the 
lack of time here. I just want to briefly summarize a little bit what we're doing here in Rostock, what's our research focus. So what we are mainly dealing with are all types of hydrogen technologies in marine applications. So in maritime, in the maritime sector, we're working on storage technologies, conversion technologies. For example, research projects we have here is how to use ammonia in engines, how you can recover hydrogen from ammonia under the specific boundary conditions of ships. Um, we're looking at the system integration. Um, it's nice to have an if you have a technology that can convert ammonia into hydrogen, whatever, if you have an engine that can run on ammonia, whatever, but it's really important that you have technologies that can really operate under the boundary conditions. And that's what we are doing here. And a very important field here we do in Rostock, specifically my colleague Bert Buchholz is the development of large engines, combustion engines that can run on hydrogen and products derived from hydrogen. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, it's needless to say that uh, in this time of crisis, it's very important for us to diversify the sources of uh, energies. And I think, I think your presentation was a very interesting uh, introduction of uh, efficiency of hydrogen energy. So uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, the first one from Damon Lai. The question goes, are there any use cases in the works that are using this potential hydrogen technology? Professor, please. Um. I'm not 100% sure what's, what's the question here. Um, are the cases um, of the works, and you mean, uh, I assume um, the actual application in industrial applications or in, on large scale, so outside the laboratory? Um, yes, there are. Um, and as you know, there's a huge variety of hydrogen storage technologies. I could have filled the whole presentation just with giving an overview about different hydrogen storage technologies. And there are many of them actually on application. So liquefied hydrogen nowadays um, is not really in use anymore. People have worked on this. People are trying to bring it up again and again. Um, but actually, it, there are too many disadvantages of it. So it, this does not really um, come back to application. Um, but for example, if you look at the LOHC technology, the liquid organic hydrogen carriers, there are... Um, some projects which are have left the university level but are dealing with providing um, industrial manufacturers with hydrogen and so on. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. The second question is from Maria Lu. What are some possible challenges in bringing the technology to market? So the main challenge for hydrogen technologies to bring them to the market in fact is the fact that natural gas is too cheap so our, the current crisis changes this a little bit but still natural gas is pretty cheap um, that's the one thing and the other thing is hydrogen currently is produced from natural gas currently it doesn't make sense to replace natural gas by hydrogen because we're producing that hydrogen from natural gas um, so hydrogen only makes sense if we really have green hydrogen, um, both ecologically and economically, as long as we don't have en enough electricity to provide the whole electricity sector with renewable electricity. It doesn't really make sense, not economically and not, not on the national level and not also not for companies to really have used electricity to produce hydrogen, which is associated with some losses, and um, to use hydrogen technology. So the main burden, the, the main thing that still keeps hydrogen technologies back right now is the insufficient 
extent of um, renewable energy so far. So what we need is much more renewable energies. Thank you. Because of the interest of time, this is probably the last question we can take uh, from uh, Simon. How would you describe the public awareness on potential and potentials and risks of hydrogen? Mm -hmm. So both are very large. So um, as I said, many people are aware of the risks. Um, many people are aware of wrong risks, so they are aware of risks that aren't really there or, or highly exaggerated. Um, and there's also huge public awareness of, at, at least in Europe um, and Northern America, um, about the potential. So people are really aware that there are huge chances, um, people expecting a lot from hydrogen, but still people are also sometimes, let's say, exaggerating a little bit um, their expectations. So not everything people are expecting regarding the um, potential is really realistic. This may be more the problem. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we have to move on to the second speaker, but uh, please, uh, Professor, type in your reply to the remaining questions. Thank you. Yes, I will. So Wait. our second speaker is uh, Dr. Yuichiro Himeda from AISD Japan. Dr. Himeda, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you and we can see our slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the inviting me. It is my great pleasure for me to be able to talk about our study. So uh, I'm Yuchiro Himeda from the AST in Japan. Uh, today, I would like to talk about high pressure hydrogen production. Uh, using the homogeneous region catalyst. So uh, this movie shows uh, uh, gas generation from the aqueous formic acid solution. So I'm be talking about uh, some interesting future of the formic acid system as a hydrogen storage system. Uh, as you know, formic acid is known as a, a liquid organic hydrogen carrier. Dehydration of the hormic acid produces the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen. However, there are another uh, decompo decomposition path of the hormic acid uh, that is the undesirable decarbonylation, decarbon which produces the water and the carbon monoxide. For the practical use, CO3 and hydrogen production by selective uh, dehydration of the hormic acid is uh, highly desired. Uh, the interesting, interestingly, uh, dehydration of the hormic acid is a uh, endothermic and uh, exogonic reaction, which, which means that the thermal runaway will not occur. Furthermore, the energy can be obtained from the, uh, this reaction. In this presentation, the energy, the energy from the reaction is uh, compression energy. So this figure shows the hydrogen storage efficiency of the barrier storage system, including the storage container. The liquid organic hydrogen carrier relative, uh, offers a relatively high volume, uh, volumetric hydrogen storage capacity and permit uh, safe and efficient long-term storage and transportation. In particular, holmic acid is a, a common bulk chemical as a stable liquid and under the ambient condition. Recently, a combination of the CO2 reduction as a hydrogen storage and dehydration of the holmic acid as a hydrogen release has received renewed attention. As you know, 
Holmic acid is a low toxic liquid and it contains a 4.3 weight percent of the hydrogen. Uh, very interestingly, uh, holmic, uh, less than 85% of the holmic acid, uh, aqueous holmic acid solution is a non flammability, shows a non flammability, which means the holmic acid is a, a safe hydrogen storage materials. Today, I would talk, uh, I would like to uh, focus on the dehydration of the holmic acid to hydrogen production. At present, there are some apparatus uh, using the holmic acid as a hydrogen storage, uh, as a hydrogen storage has been already placed on the market. For the holmic acid production, this way, from the uh, CO2, electrolyzer have been already uh, commercialized from the, this company, and we can uh, package of the electro electrical generator using the hydrogen. Uh, generated from the holmic acid. Unfortunately, program is that uh, carbon dioxide as a byproduct is uh, exhausted into the atmosphere from the, this uh, generator. Uh, until now, uh, many homogeneous uh, catalysts for the dehydration of the holmic acid were developed. In 2008, uh, Professor Bera in Rostock and uh, Professor uh, uh, Gabriel Renzi in the uh, Lausanne uh, reported the excellent catalyst, uh, which can be uh, which can works under the mild reaction condition without the uh, contamination of the carbon monoxide. After that, many efficient catalysts have been reported. However, most of the efficient catalyst requires amine additive. Furthermore. Uh, the, these uh, uh, these catalysts is, is a laboratory scale. For the practical use, uh, efficient, selective, and robust catalyst in the acidic aqueous solution without any organic additive is required. So uh, we have developed the efficient catalyst for the dehydration of the holmic acid, which is a homogeneous iridium catalyst like that. At first, I would like to show you the representative result of the dehydration of the holomic acid using the, uh, this catalyst. The reaction was carried out in the uh, aqueous solution at the 60 degree without any organic additives. A black line shows the uh, time course of the volume of the released gas. And during the uh, reaction, mixed gas uh, of the one to one of the carbon dioxide and hydrogen uh, were constantly uh, produced. At the end of the reaction, uh, holmic acid was uh, completely converted. From the gas analysis, uh, carbon monoxide was undetected in the sample gas uh, from the holmic acid. Recently, he developed a new catalyst shows a high e stability in the holmic acid solution under the reflux condition. This graph shows the uh, time course of the gas generation from the holmic acid. Uh, red line shows the uh, volume and blue line shows the uh, rate of the aerobic gas, which is very stable for the 10 hours. In this condition, uh, uh, hydrogen uh, can be produced with uh, 12.5 uh, cubic meter of uh, per hours and uh, gram of the iridium. Anyway, the iridium catalyst may be useful for the practical use due to the uh, robustness of the catalyst. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, I, I, interesting to you to the interesting property of this system uh, that is a high pressure hydrogen production from the holmic acid. As you know, high pressure hydrogen uh, feeds to the fuel cell uh, vehicle. However, compression process to the uh, uh, 70, 70 megapascal required uh, 15% of the uh, energy content of the hydrogen because of the use of the mechanical hydrogen compressor. On the other hand, uh, our 
system can surprise high pressure hydrogen generated by the wo uh, warming of the hormic acid in the presence of the uh, catalyst. As I mentioned before, uh, hydrogen production from the hormic acid is a very effective. Therefore, we investigate of the hydrogen production in autoclave, uh, that is a closed system. We can expect the pressure will be increased during the reaction. Uh, this study was performed uh, by the, our colleague, uh, Dr. Hajime Kanami. So I will show you the result. At first, use of the four molar of the uh, hormic acid solution uh, provided uh, 20 megapascal uh, of gases uh, was generated smoothly. Uh, as you can see, uh, from the 20 molar of the hormic acid solution, 123 megapascal of gases could be obtained by warming of the hormic acid uh, solution without me uh, mechanical compressor. More interestingly, conversion of the hormic acid in high pressure condition exceeded uh, the six, uh, 86%. Unfortunately, above the uh, 80 megapascal, increase of the rate of the pressure was uh, lowered. After the reaction, a uh, black solid was found, probably due to the catalyst degradation. So uh, we modify of the catalyst structure in order to the enhance, of the, enhance the durability and efficiency. New catalyst uh, could be produced uh, 157 megapascal of gases within the two hours, only two hours from the 20 molar of the hormic acid solution. As shown in this graph, uh, the obvious degradation uh, of the catalyst was not observed. Compared with the uh, previous result, uh, previous catalyst, the new catalyst uh, shows a high performance. Furthermore, under the high pressure condition, uh, carbon monoxide was uh, undetected. However, as you know, release the gas from the uh, hormic acid contains a carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide should be removed from the generated gas without deep uh, precisation. To avoid the consumption of the uh, com compression energy, uh, the development of the purification process under the high pressure condition is necessary. So uh, for the purification of the, uh, purification of the gas under the high pressure, Condition we apply to the gas, so uh, gas liquid phase separation. That is a uh, simply cooling down to the uh, separator. Uh, therefore, we made made uh, the high pressure hydrogen production system uh, equipped with a separator by the liquid gas phase. So this is the result. Uh, high pressure gas. Uh, was supplied by the dehydration from the hormic acid at uh, uh, 80 degrees and the uh, 70, uh, 30 megapascal. When a uh, gas separator was set at uh, the uh, 35 degree, we observed a single phase of the gases. On the other hand, minus 15 degrees, uh, two phases, uh, consists of the 69% uh, of the hydrogen ditch gas and the liquid hydrogen, uh, uh, liquid uh, carbon dioxide was observed. Like here, as shown in the table, the ratio of the hydrogen in the gas phase increased uh, as uh, the separator temperature was set to the lower uh, temperature at minus 50. 51 degrees, 85% of the uh, hydrogen gas at uh, 30 megapascal was obtained. We demonstrate the high pressure gas, uh, hydrogen gas separation from the generated gas simply by the cooling of the gases from the hormic acid. 
As I mentioned before, we have demonstrated more than 100 mega uh, 100 megapascal uh, high pressure gas uh, production from the holonic acid. However, few study on the high pressure gas production has been reported due to the relatively low activity and rapid degradation of the catalyst under the high pressure and in the strong acidic condition. Most case, uh, the organic solvent and additive such as amine are required for the high efficiency, but the uh, generated gas pressure is a decrease probably due to the shift of the uh, equilibrium. On the other hand, our catalyst uh, retains the activity and durability under the acidic condition and the high pressure condition. Uh, as a result, they are there is not any catalyst that uh, can produce uh, more than one mega, uh, 100 megapascal of gas seeds expected for the, our iridium uh, catalyst. So, uh, so I would like to summarize the key point of my presentation. First, I would like to develop the uh, efficient and robust catalyst for the uh, dehydration of the holonic acid in water without any organic additives. Second, we successfully demonstrated the high pressure uh, hydrogen production from the holonic acid in closed reaction system without the mechanical compressor. At this stage, 157 uh, megapascal of gases could be produced only the warming of the holonic acid solution. Finally, gas separation has been demonstrated by the gas liquid phase separation uh, only by the cooling. As a result, purified hydrogen gas and liquid uh, carbon dioxide were obtained without depressurization. It is concluded that holomic acid is a promising stability for the hydrogen storage media and high pressure hydrogen supplies. And uh, uh, I would uh, like to introduce a recent study uh, that is a CO2 hydration to methanol uh, under the very mild reaction condition, which is a very novel approach using the dinuclear catalyst in the gas solid phase reaction. Uh, the advantage of this system is that the reaction condition is much milder than the conventional kappa uh, based catalyst. And, uh, uh, finally, I would like uh, thanks for the member of the uh, Brookfield National Laboratory, especially Dr. Etsuko Fujita, and I would like to express my uh, appreciation to the uh, Gabo Laurent, uh, Professor Gabo Laurenti and Professor Matthias Vera for the fruitful discussion, and, uh, and I would like to thanks for my colleague in my institute. Uh, finally, I would like to appreciate the financial support from the uh, Jap uh, Japan Science and Technology Agency. Thank you for the kind introduction. <laughs> Attention. Thank you, Dr. Himeda, for your very, very interesting presentation. When people talk about hydrogen, they generally talk about like uh, ammonia or uh, organic uh, hydrate. So it's very interesting to know uh, about formate acid. Yeah. Okay, so let us pick up some questions from the Q&A box. So I invite uh, Dr. Himeda to check the box with me. The first question from Diamond is, mm -hmm. are, are, are there tests being done uh, beyond the lab with your hydrogen research and technology in Japan? Uh, in in the, the case of the hormic acid, maybe. Uh, In Japan, it's not no, but the, uh, the Europe and the uh, America, USA, the, they are some of the company who uh, try to the uh, hydrogen storage using the hormic acid. Uh, for example, So, uh, production of the holomic acid uh, 
in the, in the case of the uh, holomic acid pro, uh, uh, production, uh, carbon dioxide material and uh, OCO and uh, liquid light is uh, perform the, uh, this study. And now uh, in, the, uh, in the Europe, uh, some of the uh, uh, company, uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, some of the company uh, made the uh, electric generator using the holomic acid. Uh, it is not the uh, direct holomic acid fuel cell, uh, just only the, uh, 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 electric generator. Is it okay? Okay, thank you. Because of interest of time, this is going to be the last question we can mm. take from the Q&A box. Uh, were there any challenges to scale up your technology? I see you have some examples of company utilizing the hydrogen production. Uh, um, at first, the hydrogen production, uh, some company tried to the uh, hydrogen production. Uh, the, our program is, the main program is the uh, purification of the uh, gases, uh, uh, especially uh, the removal of the carbon dioxide under the uh, high pressure condition. It is very difficult. Uh, if the uh, more purified uh, hydrogen uh, was obtained, it is very useful for the uh, fuel cell uh, uh, vehicle. Okay. Okay, thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you Dr. Himeda again. Okay, now our last but not least speaker is Dr. Chen, Chen Lu Wei. Dr. Chen, please. Okay. Okay. Dr. Chen, we are seeing the notes part of your slide. Oh, okay. So yeah. uh, let me try again. Say okay. Um, perhaps uh, on the display settings at the top right hand corner of your screen, you top can right. yeah yeah next to your the display settings. Could you click on it? The next one. The next. Uh, yeah. This um, one. Yeah. Currently, we still see your notes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So how how can I switch the thing? Okay. Uh, my colleague will help share the help share your slide. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop. Yeah, take that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is this one okay? Yep, you can see us ah, your slides now. Okay, that's good. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Louis from uh, Institute of uh, Sustainability for Chemical Energy and Environment in A Star. So thank you for being here today. I would like to share with you on our work on the production of uh, sustainable uh, aviation fuel from carbon uh, dioxide. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'd like to uh, briefly give a short introduction of our institute. Then that will be next will be our work on uh, CO2 to jet fuel. And uh, our institute uh, is located at Jurong Island. And this Jurong Island is a chemical uh, industrial hub of Singapore. And there are more than 100 uh, leading uh, global companies, chemical industrial companies uh, on Jurong Island. And also uh, this Jurong Island it accounts for 60% uh, of uh, industrial CO2 emission uh, in Singapore. <coughs> 
So uh, in our institute, we have uh, five uh, core competencies uh, to address uh, sustainability in chemical energy and environment. And we also have a strong uh, collaboration with other uh, sister, sister RIs uh, under ASTAR umbrella. And in our institute, uh, we have been very active in uh, supporting the national decarbonization efforts by initiating R&D programs and projects in collaboration with industrial and academic partners. So here are our research capabilities across the CCUS value chain. So we may be uh, more focusing on CO2 capture and CO2 utilization, uh, especially uh, for this CO2 utilization conversion to fuels, and we need to uh, combine carbon dioxide uh, with uh, renewable hydrogen. Yeah, so uh, green hydrogen is important for us to realize uh, carbon neutral fuels in future. Yeah, so uh, here, uh, just a quick shot of uh, main uh, CO2 uh, CO2 utilization technology uh, has been developed in our institute, uh, such as uh, converting uh, CO2 to hydrocarbons, fuels and chemicals, and like oxygenates, such as uh, methanol, formic acid, and uh, using uh, capture integration with utilization, uh, CO2 mineralization technology and also uh, use carbon dioxide as a co-reactant for some reactions, such as it can combine with waste or plastic to do a dry reforming or a pyrolysis to obtain carbon materials and chemicals. Yeah. And uh, we have uh, offered a, vari a vari variety of collaboration models to meet uh, different needs of uh, industrial and academic, so we can have a partnership uh, with industrial academic. We can also have joint labs uh, in our institutes, uh, also technology transfer, etc. So uh, you're welcome to contact with our business department uh, for uh, any uh, collaboration opportunity in future. So now shift to the topic of uh, CO2 to jet fuel. So we all know uh, aviation industry also has their target to reduce their CO2 uh, emission uh, by half uh, compared to the level of 2005 by 2050. And currently the aviation industry, they produce roughly two to 3% of uh, global membrane carbon dioxide. So uh, however, this aviation industry has their difficulty to decarbonized by hydrogen and battery uh, due to the low uh, energy density and the weight constraint of, of batteries. And biomass, uh, biofuel, uh, the capacity is very limited. So for example, uh, in 2018, uh, it only accounts for less than 0.5% of uh, total aviation consumption. That's why we see there's a, a gap for us to fill uh, using uh, carbon dioxide as the feedstock and combine with uh, green hydrogen. So to produce synthetic uh, aviation fuel as a direct drop-in uh, fuel to replace uh, jet kerosene, the fossil-based uh, fuels. So we can see uh, there are different uh, uh, technologies uh, have been developing currently. So uh, usually you see uh, technologies based on two steps uh, uh, conversion. So the first step, they will uh, convert the CO2 into uh, carbon monoxide or uh, <coughs> CO2 with hydrogen to uh, short chain hydrocarbons like C1 to C4, then they will do another step uh, to produce liquid fuels. And uh, we are working on a single step uh, reaction, which we call modified official truck synthesis uh, process. So, uh, and in this process, right, we combine, we are developing a two 
a, a multifunctional catalyst. So we will combine uh, two steps of reaction. Uh, in a conventional way, they have a, a, a reactor in the upstream to do reverse water gas sheet reaction to uh, reduce carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. Then they will do a conventional fissure chop synthesis. So we're developing a multi a uh, functional catalyst, which we can carry out the uh, reaction, tandem reaction in a single reactor. So by doing so, uh, this will offer a simple process design because we need one reactor instead of two, and it will reduce uh, capital cost, uh, utility requirement, and also smaller uh, carbon footprint. So just give a, a roughly uh, like idea uh, for example, if uh, we have so much uh, carbon dioxide uh, to emit it, then uh, if all this carbon dioxide can be utilized to generate uh, jet fuel, so we can roughly get uh, 6 million tons of jet fuel. And the consumption of jet fuel in Singapore in 2017 is about uh, 7.8 million uh, tons. So uh, this is just show a, a simplified way uh, how we develop the catalyst. We, we uh, synthesis, uh, design the catalyst synthesis, then we uh, do uh, evaluation of the catalytic performance. And we also need to uh, understand the catalyst structure, uh, active size, et cetera. So we have advanced uh, characterization techniques to help us understand the catalyst and reaction mechanism. So this is a circle, a cycle for us to uh, keep improving our catalytic performance. And we also utilize the data uh, and uh, commercial uh, software for us to do uh, process simulation and also the life cycle assessments. So this just show uh, the performance of our catalyst and we benchmark with uh, some of the uh, leading uh, results published in, in open literature. So uh, uh, we, we uh, are happy with the uh, promising uh, pre preliminary results of our catalytic performance. So uh, we can achieve a quite a high year of uh, liquid uh, products. Uh, through this uh, multifunctional catalyst. And we also need to evaluate the uh, viability of this CO2 to jet fuel pathway. So life cycle assessment uh, was conducted to evaluate the environmental impact of this uh, pathway. So uh, example show here, we do credit to gate analysis. So uh, we quantify the environmental impacts or improvements that the new process could provide with our catalyst at this uh, very preliminary stage. That's why uh, for comparison, we use the uh, functional unit is one kg of the aviation uh, fuel, either is a standard uh, fossil based uh, jet fuel or is uh, this uh, CO2-based uh, jet fuel produced combined with uh, green hydrogen. So the system boundaries we define uh, for the conventional fossil-based uh, kerosene uh, is from the oil year extraction until the production from the factory. So the key uh, contribution uh, to the environmental impact would be the crude oil year extraction in uh, Middle East and the deliverer of this crude oil by ocean tanker and the crude oil refinery in Singapore. And the CO2 based uh, kerosene, the system boundary is from, uh, we start with the green hydrogen produced by water electrolysis, uh, use uh, green energy in Australia, then we ship it uh, to Singapore and we do this uh, CO2-based kerosene uh, synthesis in, in Singapore. So this is the system boundary we set for this life cycle assessment. So here, just show an example on uh, compare this environmental impact of this uh, 
fossil based uh, kerosene and CO2 based kerosene. So uh, you can see uh, for the all year uh, depression rate and the climate change, and uh, this uh, green color, the CO2 based kerosene, uh, definitely is a uh, more environmental, uh, environmentally uh, favorable uh, technology. So uh, <clears throat> the credit to gate uh, analysis demonstrate the benefit of this uh, CO2 based kerosene. It would be uh, greener, uh, much greener uh, compared to crude oil year based kerosene and you also reduce the uh, other like acid uh, effects and also the air pollution the, from all this uh, oil year refinery uh, industry. So in summary, uh, we have some uh, promising results demonstrate uh, the feasibility of conversion uh, carbon dioxide to jet kerosene. And this uh, CO2-based jet kerosene could potentially uh, provide significant environmental improvement over the fossil-based jet kerosene. And of course, uh, these uh, analysis are based on our uh, very small scale uh, lab results. So further environmental assessment will be required when our technology reach a higher uh, technology rather this uh, level and for a real optimization uh, in a uh, industrial plant. So uh, I would like to thank uh, colleagues who contribute uh, to the work presented here and also the funding uh, support from a star uh, UGT office. Yeah, so thank you for your kind attention and I will happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, Singapore is a hub for all the international flights. So it would be nice to improve the efficiency of the fuel, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let us quickly pick up the questions from the Q&A box. The first one comes from Simon. How far is the internationalization of exports of these hydrogen production forms? Is it mainly regional within Southeast Asia or does it reach out to the other areas such as South, uh, uh, South Asia, Europe and the America, etc., as well? <laughs> uh. This is a, a very uh, high level question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're still at uh, lab, lab scale uh, technology development that, and I think that is like, we may need to work with governments and also uh, industry to build the, the, val uh, the value chain. Okay, the next question, uh, will, we, uh, will we see large scale usage of sustainable aviation fuel in the next 10 years? Oh, maybe not, not so soon. Yeah, I think uh, now we still facing the cost competitive uh, issue because if we need a uh, green hydrogen, if we don't use green hydrogen, it doesn't make sense. But currently, the price of green hydrogen is still quite high. So our product cost will quite, uh, the large portion will come from the green hydrogen cost. Yeah, so uh, with the decrease of green hydrogen cost and the increase of the carbon tax, so we may, our price will become more competitive. Yeah, so, but I think within 10 years, maybe we cannot use in large scales. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many years? <laughs> uh, <laughs> 20? <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, okay. we, hope, we, we hope we can implement it as, as, as fast as possible, but it is it's not only one part by technology improvement. There are also many other factors will affect the implement of this kind 
of uh, jet fuel. Also, whether the standard certification of this new type of jet fuel. Yeah. I understand. Thank okay. you for your question. Thank you. Mm. So this marks the end of our webinar for today. Thank you, Dr. Chen, again. The webinar organizers would like to announce that we are planning uh, probably two more webinars in similar topics in course of time. So please uh, check it out on the website of SD Innovate. Thank you so very much again and see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.